The inverter, also known as a NOT gate, is the basic building block for any logic function. Once you have a NOT gate constructed or, or the ability to construct a NOT gate, um, you can make anything else, an AND gate, an OR gate, an AND gate, an OR gate, uh, latches, flip-flops, adders, but all that comes from um, the basics of being able to create an inverter. This uh, schematic is um, showing a TTL inverter and it takes um, quite a few more components than its counterpart which is what we're going to look at next and that's the CMOS inverter. The TTL inverter uses BJT transistors and you can see a couple other you know, resistors and, and diodes, etc. Look at how much simpler the CMOS inverter uh, circuit is. Um, it's using uh, eMOSFETs um, in a complementary fashion, so that's where the C comes from. So it's MOSFETs being used instead of BJTs, and then there's just two of them. Um, so the circuit is so much simpler, uses far fewer components. Um, that means it takes up a lot less space when you're trying to put thousands in the early days of transistors onto an IC that might be a microprocessor. Um, and in today's microprocessors, millions we're talking. Um, so. CMOS is the obvious choice, you can see, I think, for packing in the millions, even billions, even trillions of transistors that are used in today's uh, integrated circuits, microprocessors, and so on. Um, like we said, it takes up a lot less space. Obviously, the circuit's much simpler, um, uses less power because if you remember a major feature of FETs is that they're voltage controlled and don't require current. And um, if there's one drawback, it's that they're static sensitive. So um, there's that if you're doing pros and cons. But um, the pros far outweigh the cons. Um, the static sensitivity can be, uh, you know, worked around. Um, just have to be careful uh, not to damage them with static. Both of these drawings come right out of our textbook. Uh, that would be the Electronics Technology Fundamentals by Painter and Boydell. Let's look at the CMOS inverter that we have here uh, and just make sure we understand the operation. Uh, fairly simple, I think. Uh, let's see, we have five volts here. You probably know that would probably more typically be maybe 3.3 volts. Or, or even less. Uh, maybe we could put that in uh, for ourselves just to make it look even more like true CMOS. So let's do that. So <clears throat> with the 3.3 volts there, let's see if we can analyze this for what we know an inverter does. So uh, if you remember, of course, it should just invert the input so when the input's high the output should be low and vice versa. We can simply look at the two cases and see if it behaves as an inverter or a NOT gate. So we have 3.3 volts or a high on the input. Let's see if we can figure out what the output will look like and why. Um, give you a minute to stare at that, see if you can figure that out. 3.3 volts coming in to both gates. Here we have an N-channel MOSFET. Here we have a P-channel MOSFET. So VGS for each MOSFET probably would be the way to figure out what's going on. Uh, what's VGS for the N-channel? 3.3 volts on the gate, 0 volts on the source. Seems like we got 3.3. Uh, VGS, zero volts here, right? 
so VGS equals 3.3 .3 volts, right? For the P-channel, the gate voltage is also 3.3 .3 volts. The source voltage, um, though, it's upside down, you have to see, this is the source, is 3.3 .3 volts as well. Erase that 5 volts mentally. So what is VGS for the, uh, the P-channel E-MOSFET? VGS, think about it, got it. Zero volts, right? <clears throat> so now we just have to think about the operation for a P channel E MOSFET and an N channel E MOSFET. If you can remember the transconductance curve, um, E MOSFETs require some voltage at the gate to even start turning on. Well, you have zero volts VGS for the P channel. So P channel is going to be off, the P channel eMOSFET. The N channel eMOSFET has 3.3 .3 volts VGS right here. So it will be on. If Q1 is off and Q2 is on, we have the output connected to zero volts. So the output will be zero volts or a low. Looks like an inverter to me. We've got a high on the input and then that becomes a low on the output. So let's put a low on the input and see if the output goes high. With zero volts on the input, you have zero volts at each gate of each FET. That means for the N channel eMOSFET, VGS is zero. You got zero volts on the gate, zero volts on the source. For the P channel eMOSFET, you have zero volts on the gate. You have 3.3 .3 volts at the source. So be careful. VGS, if you remember, the subscript, the first subscript is the voltage uh, with reference to the second subscript. So it's the voltage at the gate with reference to the source. What does the voltage look like at the gate compared to the source? Think of a number line. Where does zero <laughs> look like it's at compared to 3.3 .3 volts? Well, zero is 3.3 .3 volts more negative than 3.3. VGS, the voltage at the gate with reference to the source, is negative 3.3 .3 volts. A negative voltage, you have to remember for a P channel eMOSFET, is exactly what will turn it on. You use negative gate voltage to turn on a P channel eMOSFET. And so, looks like Q1 is on with zero volts VGS for Q2, we do not have anywhere near the threshold voltage to turn on Q2. Q2 is off. And the output. With Q1 on, it will connect 3.3 .3 volts to the output. So it looks like your output is high. And Q2 is off. Looks like an inverter again. Zero volts on the input creates 3.3 .3 volts on the output. A low turns into a high. In the email that I sent you that I included the link for this video, I've also uh, attached a couple files. Um, these drawings are attached, although you can find them in your textbook. But then there's some other nice attachments. Um, flash memory uh, uses um, uh, something very similar to an eMOSFET. It's, uh, you can read about it. It actually uses two gates sort of stacked on top of each other 
and the uh, the floating gate is kind of trapped in there and it traps charge that comes to it based on the control gate and that trapped charge is how a bit is held um, in memory um, and so flash memory uh, that's the whole secret of flash memory your flash drive how are we getting all these files and well just all the data onto a flash drive with such high densities um, again it's eMOSFETs um, are the answer and in this case sort of a modification of an eMOSFET um, they're they're not going to use a inverters and create a latch that would take a lot of um, a lot of space a lot of circuitry uh, compared to the invention of this uh, um, this other version where you have a sort of a dual gate that traps charge you'll see you can read that one so definitely read that um, and you'll see how your flash drive uses eMOSFET technology plus sort of that dual gate thing added to it um, the uh, another attachment uh, is just sort of a history of, of uh, transistor uh, densities um, going back uh, to 1971 and actually it only goes up as high as um, 2011 so they don't have maybe the latest but it, it'll impress upon you um, how far we've come uh, as far as how many transistors they can uh, pack into a small tiny little square uh, that is the microprocessor um, and also in that handout you can see um, maybe for basic logic functions um, what transistor counts you would use um, and these would all be also uh, eMOSFET based circuits um, couldn't get it done with TTL logic and BJTs be too much uh, uh, space required and also um, the current that's required for the base currents and so on would generate a lot more heat. Um, also in the link that I, uh, the email that I sent you, don't miss the link to visual6502.org, a really cool website. Um, they've uh, deconstructed uh, microprocessors and um, looked at them under electron microscopes and um, sort of give you an inside look at what it looks like to put um, in the early days thousands of transistors onto a tiny space and um, and then move up from there there are a lot of examples on the website that that, that, that link sends you to um, uh, the 6502 I think is one right away as they give you a little look at it the RCA 1802 uh, we've looked at that in the past it's really some nice but I mean all of the examples are, are really well done really impressive uh, the uh, the patterns for all the circuits have to be drawn up and then uh, transferred to the silicon wafer um, in a process called photolithography where they'll take maybe a larger image and, and reduce it down to unbelievably small size um, but really the whole complexity and scale is um, pretty unbelievable and, and a lot of the examples you'll see on that website like say they're they're sort of retro looking at early days um, so you can imagine what the complexity looks like nowadays you can just go to the dollar store today to see a nice example of where we're at um, Jackson showed me a um, uh, dollar cost a dollar for a calculator that he then took apart and the um, the circuitry that runs the whole calculator uh, was about the size of a of a little speck like a little you could mistake it for a little fleck of black pepper on the table <laughs> and um, just so you can appreciate how far we've come to get to that point um, early days uh, to have the computing power to do even just a square root there's a whole room full of circuits and you know probably in the millions of dollars to get all that put together um, for the first time around so we've taken a room full of circuits and shrunk them down to a little fleck of pepper <laughs> you can uh, search for videos if you're interested there's a lot out there um, that would show sort of the fabrication of a microprocessor and and um, I do find it hard to believe where we're at it's a, it's an incredible process I remember I forget if it was a video or just a tutorial but they show people designing um, 
you know, it's a whole floor space they're walking on uh, to see the whole map of what they're working on. And even on the scale of a, of a very large room with the images on the floor, um, it was still very small. And then they're going to keep in mind, they're going to shrink that down to a few millimeters uh, for a little chip. It is the eMOSFET that makes it all possible. Well, still doesn't seem possible to me, but there you have it. <laughs> You'll see what I mean if you watch any of the videos that you might want to Google or, or look up.